بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Our dear students, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Today, inshallah, we are going to continue Unit 4.2 um, entitled Meiosis and Sexual Life Cycle, which we have started talking about uh, in the previous lecture. If you recall from the last lecture, we um, uh, we have spoken about the differences between mitosis and meiosis, the differences between sexual and asexual reproduction, the differences between autosomes and sex uh, chromosomes. We have also learned how to interpret karyotypes. What are karyotypes? They are basically the picture of chromosomes. So we have looked at a couple of karyotypes and we learned how to differentiate between somatic uh, cells and gametes just by looking at the picture of chromosomes. And we have learned how to differentiate between male and female. So in today's lecture, we are going to go deeper into the stages of meiosis and learn uh, what happens in each specific stage, inshallah. So what do we expect from you by the end of uh, this lecture? Let's have a look at the lecture outcomes. Um, the first thing we are going to determine and differentiate the different stages of meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. Then we are going to compare mitosis and meiosis. I know we have spoken about this last time, but we're going to look at it in details after learning the different stages of meiosis. Finally, we are going to explain the contribution of meiosis and fertilization to genetic variation. How meiosis and fertilization lead to variations or differences in the uh, genetics of the individual. So let's have a look at what we are going to learn in uh, the first uh, part of this lecture. So uh, meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. As we learned last time, uh, meiosis is divided into two divisions. The first one, which is meiosis 1, we are basically separating uh, homologous chromosomes. Okay, so that will happen in meiosis 1. While in meiosis 2, we are going to separate sister chromatids. Sister chromatids. Um, as you notice here, there are, there are four phases in each division. So for meiosis 1, we have 1, 2, 3, four and for meiosis two again we have four stages that's one two three and four now notice that the names are the same the names of the stages are the same so we have prophase here and we have prophase in meiosis two but notice the number here that's prophase one and that's prophase two. That's metaphase one. And that's metaphase two. And so on and so forth for the other stages as well. So the number here is really important in order to tell us whether it was meiosis one or meiosis two. Okay. So let's move forward. Uh, in meiosis one, the goal is to separate our homologous chromosomes. Okay, so this figure shows you an overview of what happens in meiosis one. We start with prophase one. 
as you can see here, prophase one looks more complicated than the prophase of uh, mitosis. And uh, the red and blue chromosomes basically indicates the homologous chromosomes. One is inherited from the mother and the other one is inherited from the father. And you can see here the 2N is equal to 6. What does 2N represent? Can you remember what does 2N represent? 2N represents a diploid cell. So this is a diploid cell. Diploid. And why is it six? You can see six chromosomes here. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right. And if you notice uh, in this figure that we have got a couple of new terms. Okay. Chiasmata, tetrad. I'm going to discuss these new terms in the next slide, inshallah, when we, uh, when we are going to see what happens exactly in prophase one. Then in metaphase one, of course, metaphase means metaphase plate. And you can see that the chromosomes are aligned here at the center between the two cells, which we call metaphase plate. Then in anaphase one, what happens over here, you can see that the homologous chromosomes are being separated and they are moving to the opposite poles of the cells. And you notice here that the cell is elongating. Finally, in telophase one and cytokinesis, what happens is the set of chromosomes are already in the opposite poles of the cells and you can see the cleavage pharo here which represent the start of cytokinesis which is division of the cytoplasm so basically this figure shows you the overview of meiosis one and in the next four slides we are going to discuss each stage in details All right, what happens in prophase one? Well, uh, prophase one is more complex and lasts much longer than the prophase in mitosis because there are several processes that are taking place in prophase one. So by logic and common sense, we expect that this phase is going to take much longer than the other phases. The first thing that happens in prophase uh, one is that the um, chromosomes are beginning to condense. They are becoming thicker and shorter. Okay, that's common and to prophase of mitosis. But the special thing that happens over here is that the chromosomes, the chromosomes or basically the homologous chromosomes they pair up to form what we call tetrads. Okay, so homologous chromosomes, they pair up together to form tetrad. Now, we have another term here, which is synapses. What is synapses? Synapses is the pairing of two homologous chromosomes, which take place in uh, prophase one. So the pairing of homologous chromosomes, the process itself is called synapses, and the resulting shape is called a tetrad. Tetrad, tetra is four, right? So a tetrad is basically um, the shape that forms there, which is a cluster of four chromatids. Now, let me make a small drawing so that you understand uh, the terms better. So I have this chromosome. Let's say this is maternal. It comes from the mother and I'll select a blue color. This is paternal. Okay, which comes from the father. Now, let me ask you a question. Are these two chromosomes homologous 
Well, I assume yes. They have the same length. They have the same centromere position. And let's assume that they have a similar uh, staining pattern. Okay, now, these homologous chromosomes are going to pair together. So this will move this way, and the other one will move towards the other chromosome. Okay, these two are homologous chromosomes. Now, this process where the chromosomes are moving, homologous chromosomes are moving or they are pairing up together, we call it synapses. Synapses. Okay, now what will happen there once they are paired uh, together? We will actually have this shape over here. Okay, let me select the blue color. Sorry, it's, it's the light blue one. Okay. All right. Now, this clustering of four chromatids, we call it a tetrad. This is a tetrad. Remember, tetra is four. It's because we have four chromatids. Okay, so the process is called synapses and the shape is called a tetrad. Right, that's number one. What happens next is basically called crossing over. Okay, so now that you have uh, a tetrad over there, okay, um, matching regions on chromosomes are going to break and then reconnect to the other chromosome. Okay, so basically what happens over here is, let me select a pen. Okay, so notice this region over here. Here you're going to have breaking of chromosomes, okay? The, the chromosome is going to break and rejoin with the other chromosomes. And we are going to have something like this. Let me draw it. Okay, that's one. And that's the other one. Okay, now I'll select the blue color because it has broken and joined with this one. Okay, and how will the other chromosome look like? Well, it's going to look like this. And here you're going to have part of it red in color. Okay, so the process of exchanging segments of chromosome is called crossing over crossing over. This is called crossing over. And the shape or that results, the shape that results or the point of contact exactly or the physical link that you see over here, we call it chiasmata. Chiasmata. This is a chiasmata, which is the uh, point of contact between the two non-sister chromatids. So crossing over always takes place between two non-sister chromatids. Where are the two non-sister chromatids? This and this one. These are non-sister chromatids, while this and the other one, th these two are called what? Sister chromatids. And these two together are called sister chromatids. Okay, but the exchange or the crossing over, the exchange of segments is always taking place between non-sister chromatids. Okay, let me write it over here. It takes place between non-sister chromatids. And in this diagram that I have uh, drawn, it's between the red and the blue. Okay non-sister chromatids, non-sister chromatids. 
Okay, so now we have learned uh, four new terms. We have synapses, we have synapses, and we have tetrad. Okay, synapses is the process, tetrad is the shape. Then we have crossing over, which is the process, and we have chiasmata, which is the shape. Okay, all right. Now, uh, what happens next is the formation of spindle. You can see uh, over here in this diagram that spindle fibers are, or spindle micro, microtubules are forming. You can see the centrosomes moving towards opposite poles. And you can see as well that the nuclear envelope is disintegrating it's breaking okay the nuclear envelope is breaking and the nucleoli is dispersing it's starting to disappear okay and uh, the spindle starts arranging the tetrads at the metaphase uh, plate <coughs> we will see later in uh, the next slide <coughs> Excuse me. So you can see here that many things are happening in prophase one, and that's why it lasts, it lasts much longer and it's much more complex. You have a lot of action taking place over there. You have synapses, you have crossing over, you have the spindle microtubules forming, you have the nuclear envelope and the nucleoli disappearing, etc., etc. Okay. Again, this is. Uh, 2n is equal to 6, as I mentioned in the previous slide. Now let's move to the next phase. In metaphase 1, the tetrads which have formed in prophase 1 are lining up in the center of the cell, which we call the metaphase plate. Metaphase plate, which is the center between the two poles of the cell. So what, what's happening here? You can see the tetrads are arranged at the metaphase uh, plate. How many tetrads do we have over here? Yes, we have three tetrads, okay? And the macrotubules from one pole are attaching to the kinetochore of one chromosome of each tetrad, okay? So if you see here, let's have a look at this specific microtubule. It's attaching over here on the red chromosome or, or, or the kinetochore of the red chromosome, while the one from the opposite end is attaching here to the blue chromosome in the kinetochore, kinetochore, okay? And the same for the other two uh, tetrads. And uh, now notice also that we've got these guys which are interacting which, with each other. What do we call them? Can you re recall what do we call these microtubules? Yes, we call them non-kinetochore microtubules non-kinetochore microtubules, while the other ones here, like this one, we call it kinetochore microtubule. Okay, now what's the function of uh, the non-kinetochore microtubules which are interacting together? Yes, their function is to elongate the cell. Okay, so that's what happens in the uh, metaphase one all the tetrads are lined up in the metaphase plate. In anaphase 1, the homologous chromosomes are separated and they are pulled towards opposite poles of the cell. So this is pulled upwards and its homolog is pulled downwards. So what are we separating here? We are separating the homologous chromosomes. 
homologous chromosomes. Okay, again, notice here the non kinetochore microtubules interacting together, and now we have a cell that is elongated. Okay, remember we need to form two daughter cells by the end of uh, meiosis one. That's why we need the cells to elongate. In telophase one, homologous chromosomes uh, will have reached the opposite poles of the cells. And now we have a haploid set of uh, chromosomes at each pole. If you remember, we started with a cell that has six chromosomes. And now each of these daughter cells have three chromosomes. One, <clears throat> two, three. And this is one, two, three. Okay, so meiosis one is considered the reduction uh, division because it reduces the number of chromosomes from diploid to haploid. Okay, and uh, what else happens here? Notice that I counted three, but the chromosomes are still duplicated. Each one is still double, right? Okay, so the chromosomes are still uh, duplicated, which means that each one consists of two sister chromatids. And this as well, two sister chromatids. And all of them consist of two sister chromatids. And telophase one uh, is followed by cytokinesis which is division of the cytoplasm you can sh you can see here that this is indicated by the formation of cleavage furrow because this is an animal cell and basically the cell pinches into two and by the end of cytokinesis you're gonna have two daughter cells and notice here that in some species, the nuclear envelope is reforming. You can see the nuclear envelope is starting to reform again. And this brings us to the end of uh, meiosis one. Do you think chromosome replication occurs between the end of meiosis one and beginning of meiosis two. Do you think after meiosis one, chromosomes are going to replicate again? Yes or no? I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. Okay, so the answer as you have all guessed is no. Why the answer is no. When does chromosome replication take place? Yes, that's correct. Chromosome replication takes place during the interface. When does interphase happen? It happens before meiosis one. More specifically in the S phase, okay? We have the chromosome replication or duplication. Both of them are correct terms. Now let's look at meiosis two. In meiosis two, what happens? We are going to separate sister chromatids. Okay, so the goal of meiosis two is the separation of sister chromatids. And that's why meiosis two is very similar to mitosis because in mitosis we are also separating sister chromatids so meiosis 2 is very similar to mitosis since the goal is basically the same separation of sister chromatids now let's look at this overview which uh, shows us in one image what happens in meiosis 2 and then in the next few slides we are going to see the details so here we have 
two haploid cells which have resulted from uh, meiosis one you can see cytokinesis is taken place and now we have two daughter cells let's look at prophase two again you see the spindle uh, micro microtubules are forming microtubules are forming over here and um, just let me select another pen yes microtubules are forming and uh, what else yes the chromosomes are decondensing they're becoming thicker and then in metaphase 2 you can see that the chromosomes are arranged at the metaphase plate notice here that we are looking at two cells this is one this is two this is one this is two because we have uh, two cells that have resulted from meiosis one then in anaphase two we are separating sister chromatids separating sister chromatids and finally in telophase 2 and cytokinesis we have the um, chromosomes located at the opposite poles of the cells and you can see the cleavage furrow here and we basically end up with four daughter cells and these daughter cells are haploid haploid what's the meaning of haploid the meaning of haploid is they contain a single set of chromosome which means n okay n is haploid and it means that they contain a single set of chromosomes now in the next few slides we are going to discuss the four phases in details Prophase 2 is much more simpler than prophase 1 because in prophase 2 you don't have a lot of action taking place. Uh, you don't have the synapses, the crossing over, they have all taken place. So now it's just a matter of uh, separation. Now let's have a look at the chromosomes over here. So this is a chromosome, right? This is a chromosome and this chromosome is made up of two sister chromatids. These are sister chromatids, which means that the chromosome is still duplicated. It's still double, right? Two sister chromatids. But notice over here that the two sister chromatids are non-genetically identical. Why are they non-genetically identical? Let's have a look here. I'm going to make a simple diagram so that we understand this <clears throat> phrase. Now, if I have this over here, two sister chromatids, these two sister chromatids are genetically identical genetically identical but on the other hand if I have this okay and then the other part of it is blue why is the other part blue because of crossing over what happened in crossing over we had exchange of segments between non-sister chromatids, remember? Okay, now these two are non-genetically identical. They are not identical anymore because you have this blue segment here, right? So if we separate them, this is how they are going to look like. We're going to have this and we're going to have this one so these are non-genetically identical okay and you can also see that the spindle microtubules are forming in our two cells 
and the chromosomes are starting to move towards the metaphase uh, plate. All right, now in metaphase uh, two, the sister chromatids are basically arranged at the metaphase plate in the cell and in the other cell as well. Okay, so the sister chromatids are arranged at the metaphase plate. And remember, these sister chromatids are non-genetically identical because we had the process of synapses and crossing over, which have resulted in this combination or uh, exchange of segments between uh, the chromatids. Then in anaphase 2, what happens here, we are separating the sister chromatids <clears throat> into cells. You can see the sister chromatids are being separated. And notice again here the non-kinetochore microtubules. They are interacting together in order to elongate the cell because this cell is going to give us two daughter cells and this cell over here is going to give us two daughter cells as well. That's why we need the cell to elongate. Okay, so what are we separating in anaphase two? We are separating sister chromatids, and this is very similar to anaphase of mitosis because in anaphase of mitosis, we're also separating sister chromatids. And uh, the daughter chromosomes travel towards opposite poles. Now, daughter chromatids Sorry, daughter chromosomes are the same as sister chromatids. So we can say sister chromatids or daughter chromosomes. Both of them, they mean the same thing. In telophase 2, our sister chromatids have basically arrived at the opposite poles of the cell, as you can see in this diagram over here. Okay, and notice also that the nuclear envelope is reforming. Okay, the nuclear envelope is reforming, which means our nuclei are uh, beginning to form uh, around our sister chromatids or daughter chromosomes. And now each of the four daughter cells is basically genetically different from each other. Okay, so these four cells are all haploid. They have got only one set of chromosomes, which is represented by N. And these four cells are genetically different from each other. If you look at the chromosomes of each of the four cells, you won't find any one of these that are identical. Why is that? Because we had crossing over and because uh, you have a combination over here. Okay, so just notice the red and uh, the blue parts of the chromosomes. And if you pay attention clearly to the chromosomes, you will notice that none of these uh, cells are uh, identical. So we say that the, the resulting daughter cells are genetically different from each other and also they are genetically different from the parent cell. Remember the parent cell was diploid anyways, okay? These daughter cells are haploid, so of course they're going to be different from the parent cell. And uh, after telophase 2, of course, you have cytokinesis. This is indicated by the cleavage pharo that uh, you can see in this diagram. Now let's have a look at meiosis in plant cells. Well, again, in plant cells, uh, the main things that happen in each stage are very, very similar. 
to what happens in animal cell. Of course, this is meiosis 1 and this is meiosis 2. The details of what happens in each phase is very similar. The only difference is in plant cells, we do not have cleavage furrow. But instead of cleavage furrow, we have got the, notice here, cell plate. Then the cell plate is going to form a cell wall. Okay, so in plant cells, there is no uh, cleavage furrow. Again, here, notice the cell plate by the end of meiosis 2, where you have four cells. One, two, three, four. So by the end of meiosis 1, the result is the presence of two cells. And then each one of these two cells are going to undergo meiosis 2 and you can see here that uh, we have two cells and then see in metaphase uh, 2 these are in the middle then in anaphase 2 okay chromatids are separated and then finally uh, after telophase 2 we end up with four daughter cells Okay, now the details of what we have explained previously in a meiosis in animal cell, which is like synapses, uh, tetrad, crossing over, chiasmata, and all these details, they are basically the same in plant and animal cell. The only difference is the presence of the cell uh, plate instead of the cleavage furrow. And uh, you are going to study these uh, slides in lab 10 inshallah so you're gonna see all these uh, stages uh, in the lab inshallah all right ladies and gentlemen now that we have uh, discussed all the tiny details of meiosis and in the previous lecture 4.1 we have discussed all the details of mitosis uh, so now we are ready to compare meiosis and mitosis uh, in details first let's look at the similarities between the two processes Okay, the similarity between the two is that DNA replication occurs only once during the interphase in both mitosis and meiosis. Okay, so DNA replication occurs only once. Now let's look at the um, differences. So we start at the top here in prophase. Okay, uh, if you look at, if you compare prophase of mitosis and prophase 1 of meiosis, okay, you see, first let's look at the parent cell over here, which is the common one, 2n is equal to 6, we have 6 chromosomes, <clears throat> 3 chromosomes from the mother and 3 chromosomes from the father, and this is indicated by the red and blue color. So we agreed that chromosome replication occurs only once in both divisions. Then after that, you can see that each uh, <clears throat> chromosome, duplicated chromosome, consists of two sister chromatids. Okay, so a duplicated chromosomes consist of two sister chromatids. That's in mitosis. Very simple, very sweet, very easy. Now let's look at meiosis. We have a lot of things happening over here. As you see, we have the process of synapses, which then forms the tetrad. Tetrad is the clustering of four chromatids. So this is one tetrad. This is the second tetrad, and this is the third tetrad. <clears throat> in addition to that, you have the process of crossing over, where we are exchanging segments of chromosomes. Crossing over results in what we call a chiasma. Chiasma is the point of contact, the physical contact between 
uh, it's basically the X shaped thing over here. This is chiasma, okay, which is the point of contact due to crossing over. All right, so in mitosis, no synapses, no tetrad, no crossing over, no chiasmata. In prophase one of meiosis, you have synapses, tetrad, crossing over, and chiasma. Okay, so chiasma is the plural of chiasmata. Chiasmata is one, chiasma is many. All right, now let's look at uh, the divisions, okay? So in mitosis, you have got metaphase. In metaphase, the chromosomes are arranged at the metaphase plate, while in meiosis, you have two divisions, right? You have meiosis one, then you have meiosis two. In mitosis, just one division, while in meiosis, you've got two divisions. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Now let's look at which one is similar to uh, metaphase. Is it metaphase one or metaphase two, which is not shown here. Okay, the answer is metaphase 2 because in metaphase 2 we have got our chromosomes uh, aligned at the metaphase plate while here in metaphase 1 we have got what? The tetrads that are positioned at the metaphase plate. All right, now you can see that in the first division which is meiosis 1 the cells are now haploid, n is equal to 3. Then in meiosis 2, each of our two daughter cells are going to undergo meiosis 2, and the result will be four daughter cells which are haploid. And notice that these four daughter cells are genetically non-identical, okay? Why is that? Because of the exchange of segments over here and also because of other things that we are going to discuss later on. While in mitosis, each of the resulting cells are haploid and the resulting cells are genetically identical to the parent cell. This is exactly as the parent cell. And this one as well is exactly the same as the parent cell. While here in meiosis, of course, the chromosomes, uh, the chromosome number have been reduced into half. Therefore, of course, these cells are not genetically identical to the parent cell. All right, so that's the difference between meiosis and mitosis. All right, ladies and gentlemen, now let's dig deeper into the origin of genetic variations. Why are there differences between members of the same species? Why do we have variation? What's the origin of this variation that we've got between members of the same species? Well, before we go ahead and answer this question, let's remind ourselves that the sexual life cycle uh, is basically an alternation of meiosis and fertilization, right? So <clears throat> the sexual life cycle is basically an alternation of two processes. Number one, meiosis, and number two, fertilization. Now let's look at this uh, figure again. Let's remind ourselves of uh, these two processes. So we've got a sperm and we've got an egg. These cells are called gametes 
and these cells are haploid, which means they have a single set of chromosomes. <clears throat> All right, so these gametes are going to fertilize. What is fertilization? It's basically the fusion of a sperm with an egg in order to produce a diploid zygote, which means it has uh, uh, two sets of chromosomes. One set is paternal and the other set is uh, maternal. All right, now after having an adult, in that adult you're going uh, to have meiosis one and meiosis two. <clears throat> right? And this meiosis 1 and meiosis 2, the result of these two division is having haploid gametes. So you've got fertilization, then meiosis. Fertilization and then meiosis. That's the meaning of alternation. These two processes they alternate. Basically, uh, meiosis reduces the number of chromosomes into half, and then fertilization takes the number of chromosomes into the two sets again. All right? And so on and so forth. So basically, these two processes are responsible for most of the variation that take place uh, in each generation during the sexual life cycle. The behavior of chromosomes during these two processes, meiosis and fertilization, is basically responsible for most of the variation that arises in each and every generation. Okay, so Basically, uh, the origin of genetic variation or these variations that we have uh, introduced in the last slide are basically due to three mechanisms, okay? Two of the mechanisms are related to meiosis and one mechanism is related to fertilization. Let's have a look at uh, the names of these mechanisms. Number one, we have something called independent assortment. Okay, we're going to discuss this further in the next few slides. Then the second mechanism is crossing over. You already know what is crossing over. We explain this in detail, if you, re if you can recall, in prophase one. Remember the very complicated prophase one where you have synapses and you have a tetrad, uh, you have crossing over and you have chiasmata. So basically you already know what is crossing over. And the third mechanism is called random fertilization. So in the next few slides, we're going to discuss these three mechanisms. All right, let's look at independent assortment of chromosomes first. Now let's look at uh, the word, okay? What's the meaning of independent? Independent means it's not dependent, okay? Not dependent. So it's not dependent on anything else. Okay, basically, بالعربي معناته مستقل. Okay, ما يعتمد على شيء ثاني. That's the meaning of independent. What about assortment? What's the meaning of assortment? Assortment means ترتيب أو تشكيلة. Okay, يعني يترتبوا بطريقة معينة. Assortment means organization. Okay. All right, now let's have a look at what's the meaning of independent assortment. What do we mean by it? Okay, let's have a look. Basically, homo homologous uh, pairs of chromosomes, they do what? They orient randomly. They orient randomly at metaphase one of meiosis. Okay, so... It means uh, they organize themselves 
randomly بطريقة عشوائية okay? They orient themselves randomly independent of the other chromosomes So each pair of chromosome will orient or will organize itself independent of the other homologous chromosomes Okay, now let's look at this uh, figure so that you understand what we mean uh, better. Okay, uh, let me select another dark color. Okay, so we have got a red chromosome, which is maternal, and we have got a blue chromosome, which is paternal. Right now, these chromosomes we call them homologous chromosomes. Right? Okay, now what's the probability that the red will be up and the blue will be down? Okay, we have either the, the red is up and the blue is down, or the opposite you can have the blue up, okay, and the red underneath. So, what do I mean? I mean that there is a 50-50 chance that a particular daughter cell of meiosis 1 will get the maternal chromosome and 50-50 chance that it will get the blue or the paternal chromosome. Okay? It's like when you're flipping a coin. Okay? There is a 50 chance that you get a uh, shilhanjar. 50% that you get the 50 base. Okay, the same thing here. So each pair of chromosomes sort its maternal and paternal homologs into daughter cell independently. This is the key word here, independently of the other, of this one, independent, ما يعتمد على هذا ولا يعتمد على هذا pair. Okay, that's the meaning of independent. The same thing in the second pair. Okay, now here in the second pair, we have the red up and the blue down. There is a possibility or there is a 50-50 chance that it gets the opposite. The blue is up and the red is down. And if we look at this third pair, okay, there is a 50-50 chance that you get the red up and the blue on the opposite side of uh, the cell, okay? So where does this take place? Taban it takes place in metaphase one. Okay, now we will look, we'll have a look at another figure so that you understand this concept even better. All right, so in this figure, you have got the same thing you have the maternal set of chromosomes is red and the paternal set of chromosomes is blue. Okay, now let's look at the first possibility. The first possibility is blue underneath blue, okay, and red underneath red, okay? <coughs> That's the first possibility. The second possibility is the blue here on your left hand side and then the other pair you have the red on your left hand side and then here you have red and here of course you'll have blue okay now let's look at possibility one if that's the situation then in meiosis one imagine طبعاً, this is the metaphase plate okay in the center of the cell then you're gonna get blue blue and you're gonna get red, red. Then, طبعاً, this is in metaphase two. Okay. Um, sorry, this is metaphase two, and this is metaphase one. Okay. So after metaphase two, you're gonna end up with four daughter cells. طبعاً, here this is the metaphase plate. So you're gonna get one long blue with one short blue, one long blue with one short blue. And this is the metaphase plate, one long red with one short red, one long red with one short red. So this we call it combination one. 
which is the result from one um, division okay and this is combination two now if we look at the second possibility which is this one okay طبعاً x بيكون here you have blue with red and here you have red with blue and then in metaphase two you're gonna have blue with red blue with red red with blue red with blue this is going to be called third combination and this is the fourth combination so how many total combinations do you have we have a total of four combinations if the number of chromosomes is how much how much is the number of chromosome in the parent cell how much sorry how many how many chromosomes do you have here you have got one two three four okay and the resulting combinations are four combinations okay now um as you uh, noticed the chromosomes arrange themselves independently it's independent يعني ما اذا هنا ازرق ما معناته اللي تحت بيكون ازرق okay it's completely by chance it's 50 50 chance here you have uh, blue and underneath it you have red that's the meaning of independent independent okay now in the next slide we're gonna learn how to calculate the number of combinations in this case it's very easy to, ca to calculate it because we've got only four chromosomes but what if you have 20 what if you have 40 what if you have a human cell where we have 46 chromosomes how are you going to calculate the number of combinations let's learn that all right so this is the formula for calculating the number of possible combinations uh, when chromosomes assort independently into gametes the formula is 2 to the power of n okay what is n well n is the haploid number of the organism it's the haploid number of the organism for example what's the haploid number of a human species what's the haploid number of us human species haploid not deployed okay I'll give you a few seconds to think about it yes that's correct our haploid number is 23 all right let's look at this example an organism has a somatic cell with eight chromosomes notice somatic somatic cell and n is the haploid number of organism right the haploid cell which is n has four chromosomes remember somatic manata 2n we want n because the formula says n so we just divide by 2 we get 4 the possible combination is 2 to the power of n which means 2 to the power of 4 which will give you 16 different combinations okay let's look at another example okay for human the diploid human cell contains 46 chromosomes we already know that okay now let's look at the haploid cell which is n n in this case is 23 now let's plug in this number into the formula 2 to the power of n means 2 to the power of 23 now if you plug in these uh, numbers into your calculator you're gonna get a very huge number and that is 8 million 8 million which means 8 with six zeros so that's a very huge number okay this is in one uh, gamete okay 8 million different combinations are possible 
All right, let's move to the second mechanism. The second mechanism is crossing over. We already know what is crossing over. Let's have a look at this figure on your right. Okay, so this is a tetrad. The process that created this tetrad is called what? Synapses. Sorry, excuse my handwriting. Okay, now let's look at the non-sister chromatids. The non-sister chromatids means blue with the red. Okay, these guys are going to cross and exchange segments from their chromosomes. Okay, that will happen in prophase one, remember? Then in metaphase one, they are going to arrange themselves in the metaphase plate. Then in metaphase two, you can see they have separated. And now we have four daughter cells. Now let's have a look at these daughter cells. This one, the first one, contains just the blue chromosome, right? So this is paternal. And this at the end contains just the red chromosome. So this is maternal. But these guys in the middle, they have this one, it has blue and then it has red as well. And the other one is opposite, it's red and it has blue at the ends. These we call them recombinant chromosomes. They are not only paternal, and they are not only maternal. So we call them recombinant, which means it's a combination of paternal and maternal. Okay, so you can see that crossing over producing produces recombinant chromosomes, which does what? It combi combines genes that are inherited from each parent. So there you're having further combination. If you recall in the previous slides when we were talking um, about uh, random or independent assortment, which is random combination of chromosomes. Okay, we just had the blue and the red, but we, we didn't talk about crossing over at all. So this is an extra uh, factor here that actually leads to a genetic combination. It gives you a combination of gene between your mom and your dad. It's not only the random assor assortment, but in addition to that, you have another factor. And this is the second mechanism. All right. Okay, now let's look at the third mechanism. Um, the third mechanism of genetic variation is called random fertilization. Okay, so uh, a zygote, which is a combination between an egg or an ovum and a sperm, is produced by the mating of a woman and a and a man, and this zygote has very, very unique genetic identity. Why is that? Let's have a look. <clears throat> what does random fertilization mean? Okay, so an ovum is one of possible 2 to the power of 23 chromosome combination. Remember, this is related to the first mechanism, which is independent assortment, 2 to the power of n. And this gave us 8 million combination. But a zygote is not just an ovum, right? A zygote is an ovum plus sperm. So a sperm that fertilizes that ovum is also one of 8 million possible combinations. So that's again 8 million. Okay, so a zygote is ovum plus sperm. Okay, now let's calculate 
the probability of this specific ovum getting fertilized with that specific sperm. The fusion of these two will produce a zygote with any of 64 trillion combination, which is 8 million times 8 million because that's how you calculate combinations you multiply this is going to be equal to a very very huge number which we can't even imagine subhanallah it's 64 trillion how many zeros is trillion do you know how many zeros is trillion so that's um where is my thingy okay that's six zeros which is one million and this is another six zeros which means a trillion is 12 zeros that's 64 followed by 12 zero yes ladies and gentlemen that's why brothers and sisters can be so different okay and basically the message is you are really unique because you each one of you is basically one of that 64 trillion combinations okay of that 64 trillion combination you are the unique one that came or existed or was created in this life okay you're all smart you're all special you're all unique ladies and gentlemen and this takes us not only to the end of this lecture but also to the end of this course because this is the last lecture of the semester all right i hope you enjoyed and learned a lot from all the recorded lectures it was really my pleasure to be with you in the last seven lectures of this uh, semester um, inshallah i wish you all the very very best in the assignment okay of unit four and also in the uh, final exam it was my pleasure again thank you very much for tuning in and i wish you all the very best in this course general biology one and also in all your other courses all right take care everyone and see you soon inshallah <laughs>